Welcome everyone. I'm Nicole Robinson, the chair for this session. We have um, three amazing presentations uh, for today's conference, the last day of the conference. I hope you've been enjoying CREA 6. Um, I always find these times to come together a gift to learn uh, from the wisdom and talents of others in our field, uh, to grow individually um, and personally. And in the midst of uh, this pandemic, the twin triplet pandemics, racism, colonialism, um, to have shared community and to grow our practice uh, toward uh, dismantling, disrupting oppression. Um, the sessions that we have today are um, uh, a mix of videos and in person, but we will have a live uh, Q and A at the end. So feel free as you're listening to um, the speakers present either through the video or live to um, pop your reactions into the chat. That's really helpful to sort of recreate um, some of what we're losing by still being in this you know, virtual world. Uh, feel free to ask your questions as they come to you or jot them down. Um, at the end, we hope to either ask the um, give you a chance to unmute your mic and if you feel comfortable, um, show your video to ask the presenters the questions directly. Um, but I'm also happy to uh, uh, ask your question for you if you just want to type it into the chat. So please do that. And also as another instruction, if the question's directed to a, a particular presenter to include that as well. Um, so if it's for Brent or Carrie, Lori, Thomas, Lawanda, and so forth, please uh, include that as you note the questions. Um, I think that's it in terms of housekeeping. You'll receive as you've been um, receiving each day of the conference an evaluation form, please encourage you to fill that out. Evaluators are, are notorious at not doing that. <laughs> so please do that uh, to get good karma for your next evaluation survey. Um, so with that, I'm going to uh, turn it over to the first presentation, which is customizing mindset interventions to navigate the isms of higher education intersectionality as an institutional variable. And this is by Luanda Cummings um, and her team. And we have a video that uh, they have prepared for us that we'll now watch. Good morning or good afternoon. This is Dr. Luanda Cummings from the Florida Caribbean Lewis Stokes Regional Center of Excellence. Today, we're going to be going through a brief presentation around the customizing mindset interventions to navigate the isms of higher education and really looking at intersectionality as an institutional variable. Today, I'll be presenting on behalf of the center, but my co-author is Dr. Janae Chandler, a previous director at Santa Fe College, and I myself am the director at the University of the Virgin Islands. So we have two main learning objectives today. The first is to identify the elements of psychosocial barriers that contribute to STEM attrition among underrepresented minorities. We also are going to discuss the process and modalities for developing customized interventions using evaluation data to apply growth mindset intervention in STEM classrooms that really honor institutional diversity. And so I wanna start out by just clarifying who we are. We are the Florida Caribbean Lewis Stokes Regional Center of Excellence, and we are funded through the National Science Foundation and NSF Includes. And we have are part of the original six of the Lewis Stokes Regional Centers of Excellence, and we're funded in 2018. We are a part of a collaborative partnership between Santa Fe College, Community College, and the HBCU, the University of the Virgin Islands. And unlike some ILSAMP initiatives that are focused on student performance or outcomes, we are uh, charged to conduct research and to develop STEM implementation activities that will broaden participation in STEM, STEM as well as to broadly disseminate our successful practices and contribute to the body of knowledge. What is really phenomenal about this particular center is that Santa Fe is the only community college that is actually leading one of these centers. And we do our work not by ourselves, but in collaboration with some amazing uh, individuals with specialization in this area. 
Our social psychologists include uh, Dr. Valerie Purdy Greenaway and Dr. Omi Fatui, who work tirelessly in the development of these interventions. We also have faculty development experts like Diana Bowen and Dr. Miguel Hernandez uh, for different institutions that have specialization around growth mindset or cultural inclusion or some of the other strategies that have been really important with the new situation in regards to COVID-19. And in particular, we are focused on central, the Central Florida LSAMP, the Florida Georgia LSAMP, and the Greater Alabama Black Belt Region LSAMP. And these are our partners. Uh, we have six institutions that have joined us in this critical work. And so I want to jump into our psychosocial barriers and psychological interventions. This particular center is really focused on intervention development around mindset. And mindset is really important because it really includes a set of beliefs or a way of thinking that determines a student or faculty member's behavior, outlook, and their mental out, their me mental attitude. And we know that in, the, in many ways, if you think you can or you think you can't, as Henry Ford said, you are correct in birth, both estimations. And so we are in the process of helping our students, helping our faculty to rethink what it means to have a mindset that is focused on growth and development. And some of the factors that we know that contribute to underrepresentation includes concepts like stereotype threat. All of these are well-documented in the literature. Um, issues around efficacy or agency and confidence around STEM content, implicit theories of intelligence, either thinking that people are smart or people are not, but not understanding the capacity for growth and mastery. We also see where students are sometimes lost in the system because of a sense of belonging, not feeling that they belong within the academic space or the colleges in which they attend, and our students having a lack of STEM identity. Now, above and beyond what we know in regards to these risk factors individually for students, we also found that within our six partnering institutions, there was a diversity in regards to the students that they were working with. This partnership between community colleges and HBCUs allowed us to really have an interesting focus on really students that may be not traditional or any number or trade focus that are usually at these community colleges or working with a HBCU or HSI that is focused primarily on a particular minority group. And so we found these six different ways of diversity and that manifested for our institutions. They were either HBCUs, HSIs, or PWIs. They were either primarily serving rural or urban communities. We had institutions that were majority uh, non-traditional or traditional. And all of these different ways of difference or diversity had a lot to do with what was the student population and their particular needs. And therefore our customized intervention had to take that into consideration that our students have interlocking realities that may have something to do with their estimation around their capabilities to do well in STEM. Therefore, we used all of this information in the process of customizing our intervention design. And so we incorporated student voice through focus group and surveys. We found inside that space that students had a different interpretation of struggle. Like, is this grounds for me to quit? Or do I do the work to overcome? We also saw for many of our students in STEM spaces, they saw help seeking as evidence of weakness. We worked on incorporating faculty voice and those data points, looking at student grades, as well as the evaluation uh, feedback from our faculty after engaging in the interventions and the trainings that were provided. And that information allowed us to do some reframing of the variables that we had that was more customized to the faculty as well as the student populations of focus using adaptive mindset, which is a new concept, uh, ways in which we looked at support network and function and looking at aspects of institutional mindset. So we really worked at using evaluation in the customization process. As you can see here, it was about the design of the program, about being able to focus the evaluation, 
be really clear on how to gather ev evidence and justify those conclusions of either successfully addressing or bringing the psychosocial intervention into play or not. And then also going back and assessing using benchmarks, whether or not they, they were successful or not, so that we could ensure loose use and share the lessons that we had learned to our stakeholders. It was really important for us to think of these things because we're building out standards around how do we uh, reach out and do this customized work by focusing on the utility, the feasibility, the propriety, and the accuracy of the work that's being conducted. And we move forward into using these evaluations to ways in which we communicate to those that are a part of our stakeholder network. And that includes our team, the external evaluator, the advisory board, they all contributed to the development in regards to the psycho psychological theory and interventions that were being developed. And then we also see on the other side, our community partners, our students, and our faculty, their voices also became a part of how we built out these customized interventions. And our social psychologists helped us be able to ground these things in theory that was theory within the field. And the evaluation allowed us to, to deliberately build feedback loops with those who are stakeholders, because at the end of the day, we're building a community of believers and students that have growth mindset and are in a position to have success within the STEM realm. And so we see where these interventions ended up going through a type of evolution. Student, the student interventions be, incorporated the evaluative data, and then we saw the factors shift so that they were more closely associated to student experiences. For faculty, the evaluation data allowed us to be able to look at how we could best address some of the new needs in regards to COVID-19 and ways our faculty had to pivot. And so I wanna share a couple of our student-facing interventions. The first year, we really focused on value affirmation and implementation intention, but this wasn't really reflective of the needs of our students at these different institutions. So using the data as well as focus group data, we ended up looking at a new concept and that is adaptive resilience. In year two, we used that as our customized intervention and it really recognized that cer certain students respond to difficulty by trying to get through it on their own. We also call this over efforting, right? I have to do well for my whole community, my whole family. And the research shows really that you need faculty, you need peers to actually be more effective in your learning process. And we wanna be in a position to help students move away from the concept of resiliency as a solitary effort. Inside our faculty facing interventions, we move to many more virtual uh, experiences as well as opportunities for training that was specific to this new pivot into virtual spaces. And we ended up with eight different opportunities for faculty members to engage around growth mindset, to engage around psychosocial interventions and hone their craft as they move into their classroom. But not only did we work on being responsive to what faculty needed in this season during COVID, we also created a bevy of online resources and mindset STEM for, or for, for STEM.org resources where each of these trainings are not only available now, well, not only available when it was offered, but also uh, thereafter. And we developed a professional learning community among the faculty members as well as liaisons using a PLC model so that our mindset ambassadors could begin to challenge the culture on their campus and bring theory to action in different types of research projects, implying these particular tools and also engaging reflective practice with peers. And so for us, there are some clear implications and recommendations. The first is that you need to incorporate the evaluation as soon as possible because it's critical in the formative stages of intervention development so that we don't fall into the trap of cookie cutter interventions. You also wanna have an active evaluation team because that helps the program retain flexibility around how to customize and meet the needs of students and faculty. Also, these customized interventions require acknowledgement of how institutional diversity impacts the psychosocial needs of students and faculty. And it's important information for 
the person that's teaching and also for the institution in regards to building out structures uh, for support and contextual um, contextual support for students. We also want to point out that incorporating the voice of students, faculty, the team, and, uh, and our evaluators within, within a feedback loop bolstered the project success and allowed us to be able to be effective. So if you have any questions, please reach out here at my email. Here are some references and thank you so much for your time. Thank you so much. Um, again, feel free to uh, pop those questions into the chat or um, at the end, keep those in mind. And when we open it up, I, I hope you're um, encouraged to respond to uh, what seems to be a really rich intervention. And I believe the next uh, session is also going to be a video. And this one is with, um, Carrie and Lori, who are with us today, and it's on evaluation strategies and outcomes of inclusive excellence STEM faculty. Welcome to the presentation by the University of Northern Colorado entitled Evaluation Strategies and Outcomes of Inclusive Excellence STEM Faculty. I'm the director of this HHMI grant and my colleagues, Carrie Englert, who is our external evaluator, and Dr. Laurie Reinsbold, who's responsible for project assessment, will join me for this talk. We'd also like to acknowledge um, the contributions of Jessica Allen, Dr. Elizabeth Kersey, and Emily Phillips. Next slide. In 2017, we were awarded an HHMI Inclusive Excellence Grant. This grant opportunity aims to improve culture and instructional practices at universities and improve outcomes for students from marginalized populations through institutional change. Our Inclusive Excellence Teacher Scholar Workshops are designed to provide continuous interaction among small cohorts of faculty to build faculty capacity to support an increasingly diverse student body and to assist faculty to gain awareness of their own implicit biases, beliefs, values, and privileges. The topics we covered are organized into four constructs, which reflect various aspects of teaching. With a foundation of faculty cultural competency, who we are, participants explore the content of their courses, what they teach, pedagogical approaches, how they teach, and evaluation paradigms, how we assess. Given the complexity of teaching, some topics fit into more than one construct, but we found that by paying explicit attention to these four constructs, it helped us balance and, balance and build on our content throughout the workshop series and not default to focusing on a, the more accessible constructs, for example, how we teach. Next slide. Thank you so much, Susan. So just to talk about the evaluation a little bit, at the start of the project, it was really important for the evaluation to focus on the goals of the project team. So I really like this quote from Ernie House because it emphasizes the intentionality of the evaluation effort, which is to say that the two main goals, so what we wanted to understand was the degree to which the faculty first were increasing their awareness, knowledge and disposition towards engaging in equity-minded practices, and then how they use that knowledge to engage in changing their practices. So next slide, please. So based on those goals, we developed this theory of change that shows what we believe to be the evolution of that change, that the faculty really needed to understand their own biases and how microaggressions were happening in their own lives. And then once they started to build their understanding of equity, they started to reflect on their own idea or their own lives. So once um, faculty started to build their understanding, they were reflecting on how that manifested in their classrooms and how they could modify their practices. And finally, the main goal was really to have a positive impact on the university climate. And while this figure is really linear, I think the participants and the project team really recognize that each of these processes is ongoing um, and that change can be very microscopic, but that the evaluation data are showing faculty commitment to that continual engagement. Next slide, please. Um, and as I mentioned, the steps along the continuum can be really small and also they're not linear. 
So it was really important to collect data in multiple ways across different time points to understand those complexities. So for example, we collected survey data and course artifacts. We also analyzed faculty reflections on the process. Um, and those have been a really powerful source of information on the challenges they're facing and the successes that they're having. In addition, the distal outcome for the project is related to students successfully completing courses. And we're seeing some preliminary evidence that students of participating faculty have a higher course completion rate relative to historic data, which is really exciting. Um, and I'm going to turn this over to Lori to really talk about some of the results that we're seeing. Thank you, Carrie. Using results from our equity-minded survey, we find that cohort three participants' understanding of equity improved after program completion. Over time, faculty disagreed more that equity-mindedness means treating all students the same and agreed more that they were aware of their students' cultural experiences in a way that allows them to support students' intrinsic motivation. And they were more confident that they can give examples of implicit biases that negatively impact students' sense of belonging. A comment that illustrates faculty's relative improvement in understanding equity is, the university culture has changed, and I think it is time that I shift my thinking too. This course has helped me change that perspective, but in a good way. Instead of feeling like I have to change because I am being forced to change, I feel I am changing my thoughts and perspective because I am understanding it better. Participants' knowledge and practices increased after program participation. Faculty grew in their confidence that they could give examples of microaggressions <clears throat> and stereotype threats that negatively impact students' sense of belonging, and that they can explain the differences between equity, equality, and diversity. Relative to this growth in knowledge, a participant noted, a lot of experiences over the last six months have helped me rethink my teaching practices and expectations. Instead of having these expectations of what students should be doing or how I should be teaching, I have learned to give a little. The perspective I have gained has really helped me to see or understand where students are coming from more. And to me, that has helped me build rapport with them better than I have in the past. After program participation, students' practices changed. Overall, participants became more confident to use student data to identify equity gaps, considered how their class structure and assessment impacted students from marginalized populations, and prioritized equity-minded instructional practices in class. A participant's quote illustrates the increase in changes of practice. Students communicated with me more this semester than in the past. I received multiple emails thanking me for being kind. Those small emails usually included more detail about how they were learning and how the course was changing their ideas about how to teach science. <clears throat> we found that past participants continue to identify ways to improve the climate of the classroom through their practices. For example, 75% believe that they have, at least to some extent, a better relationship with students from different backgrounds. 47% agree to a great extent Hi, that they have confidence to fully participate in activities that advance equity. A participant noted, I am confident oh. making sure all students are heard. I am still uncomfortable addressing confrontations that may happen in my class. On to you, Susan. So one of the goals of the project was institutional change. And over the past four years, Hi, have, Shaw, um, are you able to pause the video so that we can um, of the see the slides? To the okay. Hi, Shaw, uh, we're having technical issues on our end. So we're not seeing the slides advance. Oh, can you okay. Pause it and restart, or just All right. pause and then start it at this point. Okay, give me a moment. Give me a moment, I think there's some technical issue here. Thank you so much, Nicole. I, we were also wondering, Lori, I don't know if you feel comfortable just jumping in and presenting your slides live so we know that they advanced. I think that's where the they got stuck. 
right at the transition. Nicole, is that a good idea? Is there time for that? If we can pick up where the audio lecture was, I think we will have time for that. I'm, I'm so sorry. I think it's on the Zoom. I cannot see uh, the participants as well. Yeah, no worries. I think um, Lori is going to present live the remaining slides. And Thanks Lori, so much, you're, everyone. Yep, Lori, you're a co-host, so we should, uh, if you share your screen, we should be able to see your work. And I apologize for that. Tr try to avoid the tech glitches with a video. And All right. <clears throat> can folks see that slide? Um, we can <clears throat> also see your presenter slides as well. Ah, okay. How's yep, that? It looks, it looks perfect now, thank you. Thank you, Nicole. So, <clears throat> Looking at our findings um, it, based on an equity-minded survey, <clears throat> we saw that cohort three participants um, increased in their understanding of what equity is <clears throat> after the participation. As you can see from this um, graphic, the increase in the, I believe that equity-mindedness means treating all persons the same. They recognize that <clears throat> that is not a valid um, statement. Um, they went on to also look at students' cultural experiences in a way that allows them to support the intrinsic motivation. So we see a nice progression in terms of their understanding of what equity-mindedness is <clears throat> to them. And um, again, a quote from a cohort three participant, the university culture has changed. And I think it is time that I shift my thinking too. So that's an example of, you see the shift in participants' equity-minded understanding and thoughts about themselves relative to <clears throat> their students. Looking at their knowledge and, pr and practice, again, they built their, no they built their knowledge in our, in our intervention. Now they're thinking about their practice and the knowledge of that, what, what to do and how to do it. And we, we tapped into that um, perspective as well with our surveys. <clears throat> and you can see that there's increases in, I am confident that I can give examples of microaggressions that negatively impact students' sense of belonging. Looking carefully at sense of belonging and how students are feeling they're recognizing the importance of recognizing how students feel. So this was really important across the, <clears throat> across the, the survey and the results. Thinking about stereotype threat, thinking about microaggressions um, is really important. As you can see from the quote, a lot of experiences over the last six months have helped me rethink my teaching practices relative to students and their, and their sense of belonging. <clears throat> Thinking about how their practices um, are changing and that has increased as well over time. Again, this was a six month, <clears throat> excuse me, a two semester project. So again, we were involved with them over that time period. And again, we're seeing progression in their um, change in practices. I am confident that I can use students data to identify and interpret equity gaps. That was a huge increase for us in this project. That was great to see. Um, because looking again at who are my students, how are they doing? And where were they at? How are they improving? This was a, a great find for us. <clears throat> also, I consider the impact of students from marginalized student groups when I'm structuring my class time and the assessments. Another good, good pro progression for our participants. I prioritize using equity-minded instructional practices in my class. <clears throat> so we are really pleased to see this progression from our, our faculty over, over time. And again, from the quote, you can see from students communicated with me more this semester than in the past. I received multiple emails thanking me 
um, for my, being kind. Those same emails usually included details about how much they're learning and how the course has been changing their ideas about how to teach science in this case. So that was a good, <clears throat> a nice piece and reflection of, of what we're seeing in our, in our project. So when we looked at, we had three cohorts over three years. So the first two years, we, we, we were continuing touching base with our, with our participants with, with external evaluation surveys, <clears throat> keeping in touch with them to learn their, their, how they're, what they're doing, what they're knowing, how they're changing their practice. And again, we can see that um, in the first, the first two cohorts, they, they continue to believe they have, and at least to some extent, a better relationship with students from different backgrounds in their classes. So again, their sense of connecting, helping, supporting in an equity-minded way is continuing in, this, in, this, in their work after the intervention, but continuing on in, in their work. So that was great to see. <clears throat> and um, looking at a, another uh, survey finding is to what extent do you have confidence to fully participate in activities in advance? Again, we're seeing an increase in that over time, and to what extent do you continue to modify your classroom practices based on what you learn about equity-minded practices? We see an increase in that as well. So again, this, the, the, the faculty are engaged, are thinking, are continuing to move forward after the intervention, if you would, and moving forward to that. So we're pleased to see their continuing reflection and practice. So looking at institutional change, um, again, HHMI really wanted us to impact institutional change, not just faculty, but also what the institution is doing <clears throat> and how faculty are aware of that as well. So we see that 31% have used inclusive excellent principles to advocate for marginalized students at the institutional level. And <clears throat> looking at some quotes from faculty, our department has regular meetings about equity recently. And we are rewriting some policies regarding student behavior in the field and evaluation practices. We are um, removing the GRE requirement for graduate applicants. Um, when the grad committee discussed this change, equity was a big consideration. So we are having an impact as a project on the faculty themselves and they are then looking at and, and having a voice in what the institutional is looking at doing. This is a great, great piece to see as well. <clears throat> Carrie, would you like to continue or if you want to continue, Laura, that would be great. Okay, I'll continue. Just want to make sure. Are we okay, Nicole, to continue? Yes, you have a, a couple more minutes. Yep. Thank you so much. Okay. So winding up here, <clears throat> looking at the themes that we're seeing regarding our evaluation work. Um, Again, sustained engagement in activities over the year, high participation rates in our interventions, if you would, in our workshops that we're offering our faculty. About 90% of faculty stay with the program for the entire year. So that's a positive piece as well. Growth in, in awareness across all measures. Faculty become better aware of their biases, which we feel is an important piece to start with. Thinking about themselves relative to our marginalized students and what their feelings are, that's an important step to change practice. And they, they spend time reading, reflecting, discussing, and, and, and understanding. Change in practice, again, is, is following through with that. Faculty often discuss the challenges of the work in terms of changing practices and how our faculty <clears throat> express their belief in the <coughs> excuse me goals of the work and are committed to continuing to work toward change. So they value this work. And that's great to see. Looking ahead, this is our, our last slide, I believe. The project has engaged over 40 STEM faculty members. Faculty disseminate materials to colleagues in their department. So again, they value this work and want to share it with others. They're staying engaged in workshops are being transitioned to a permanent home at UNC, University of Northern Colorado. And equity has become part of, the, of major decisions at the university, including hiring policies. Thank you so much and I appreciate your patience with us. Thank you, Lori. Um, I, I'm sure folks have pro will probably have more questions. Um, thank you, especially for like being able to just jump in. 
and having your slides handy. Um, we will now Appreciate go to the opportunity. Our, <laughs> yes. Um, we'll now go to our, our final um, paper, which is uh, will be presented live. And this is uh, the presenter, Brent, is available. And uh, while they're preparing, this is on criminal justice reform, starting with culturally relevant transformative capacity building reentry model. Okay, I'm going to share my screen. And uh, please do, uh, 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 you know, give us a reminder about our time if we happen to uh, talk too long. Um, oops. How do I make this? Uh, are you guys able to see this? Um, it's a little small. If you can put it in presentation mode or enlarge it, that would help us. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Better? Uh, nope. Yep. There you go. Perfect. Perfect. Okay. So my name is Brent Dinn and uh, my co-presenter is uh, Dr. Thomas Kenamore. Uh, we, you know, when we created this, uh, we, we both of us were at Loyola and then uh, most recently I went over to Chicago State University. So I thought I would do them service by bring up the logo here. Um, and basically what we want to do is uh, present to you the current issue about the poor reentry uh, rate. Uh, of the people coming out of the um, prison system and what we think from our part, what we need to do uh, to uh, raise awareness about this, uh, why we're having this problem and what we should be doing. And which basically points to becoming more culturally sensitive, therefore responsive and relevant to the needs of the people coming out of the uh, prison system. Um, and then uh, being more, helping them to be more transformative and capacity building. So I'll uh, ask Dr. Kenmore to present. All right, I just unmuted and, and remember to do that. Uh, thank you. Um, I just wanna say uh, that what, one of the things that Brent and I share or have in common <laughs> besides wearing matching bow ties is that we're Sorry, both, right. uh, besides academics, are, um, are social workers. And um, as you may know, the, the social work mission is about helping oppressed populations and changing social conditions that impact them, which is why this is um, this particular focus on the uh, reentry population is relevant to us. So I've just, we've just thrown up some figures that um, document or demonstrate what most of us already know, which is, I, I think, a, a, a loose figure to keep in mind uh, about uh, who's, who's impacted by interaction with the criminal justice system. Uh, at any given time, there are about 7 million people that are either in jail or prison or in some form of supervision after release. Uh, these other numbers, um, 731,000 detainees are in jails. Uh, these, these are folks that uh, may or may not get uh, convicted because they're often in jails waiting to go before the judge. Um, um, only 38% are convicted um, and 62% are released, but they've already uh, obtained a, a record. Um, um, you can just quickly look at those other numbers there and we will move on to the next slide. Um, so uh, upwards of 95% uh, of those incarcerated are released back into their communities. Uh, as uh, regular citizens uh, with no uh, a connection with the uh, folks with a criminal background, we often We'll hear on the news about prisons and people in prison and people convicted of this or that and they're forgotten. What is true and real is that most of those people who get into prison come back out. And their, um, their condition, the conditions that they're in and the conditions that they come into are 
quite challenging. There's uh, less and less access to available resources. Uh, they're predominantly uh, poor inner city African-Americans and Latinos. Uh, a book by Michelle Alexander, uh, The New Jim Crow, uh, uh, discusses this the, the inter intersection of race and incarceration. Um, very large uh, numbers of people with mental health problems and substance abuse problems. Homelessness is a common experience, uh, be both before and after incarceration, of many of the people, and poor uh, levels of education and low employment rates uh, are some of the built-in characteristics of most folks who uh, are getting out of prison. Next slide, please. Um, I want to just say a few words about reentry programs. There are a lot of them. Uh, there have been a lot of them for many years. Um, uh, reentry outcomes are measured by a recidivism rate, meaning if you get out of prison, uh, if you get uh, rearrested and and or sent back to prison, uh, prison, uh, you're part of the recidivism rate. Um, uh, and the numbers are not uh, are not great, um, as you can see. Uh, Sixty, almost sixty eight uh, percent of those released are rearrested within three years. In five years, it's seventy six six. Um, so overall, the reentry programs that are available uh, reduce recidivism by about six percent. We have, we'll talk in a minute about some of the problems with this measure. Um, one of the things that um, if, uh, folks who evaluate uh, reentry uh, success or failure um, focus on is outcomes like stable housing, uh, em steady employment, uh, reintegration into the community, um, uh, staying off drugs, um, et cetera. Um, these are outcomes that are fairly blunt. Um, what, what, the, what those outcome approaches don't look at are the process of reentry, and they don't look at, at the psychological and relational factors that are so important in uh, reentry success. Next slide. Okay, so, um... Uh, you know, we briefly described uh, the nature, the landscape of reentry population and some of the failures that we uh, have. And um, there's been a concerted effort to um, do something about this. And so uh, in the social work field, uh, there's been some movement called grand challenges. They identify some of the challenges they really need to put all our effort into. And one of them was a thing called smart decarceration. And um, this author uh, and uh, her group from, uh, from uh, various universities throughout the United States came up with a, a newly proposed model of reentry programs, recognizing some of the significant failures and obvious problems that we have. And so they created a, they did an extensive study. It was not a systemic uh, review, but a systemic identification of known reentry programs the intervention reentry programs that were evaluated for effectiveness, which were, um, they were effective because they really focused on mental health issues, substance use, tangible life skills, cognitive skills, relational skills, job readiness, and transitional employment. So even within that list, you could kind of get a sense as to how do you help somebody survive out in the community after being institutionalized for so many years. And, uh, some of the practice approach measures considered, uh, that were considered to be effective were things like motivational enhancement. Uh, when you can motivate somebody toward improving their life, then you have a good chance of their, keeping that person out in the community rather than returning back to prison. Shared decision-making, decision tree, care coordination, treatment readiness, retention, and therapeutic alliance. And what I would like everybody to kind of see is that these all sound very uh, promising, very positive. And indeed, if you work on some of these areas, yes, you do see an improvement. However, what 
is lacking even in this newly proposed model reentry program is the there is a lack of recognition for cultural differences because when you have people coming out of prison after being absent from a society that's moved on without them and they're returning back to that cultural norm we need to really do a better job of understanding what that culture dictates or the, what, what the values and belief system look like. So there is a lack of cultural sensitivity, responsiveness, and therefore relevance, which really leads to transformative experience or growth, which leads to capacity building. So the idea of how do you build this capacity within an individual so they can move on with their life. So, <clears throat> Even this uh, newly um, um, uh, newly proposed model, um, and they called it a well-being development. So they recognize the need for helping people feel better about themselves and this holistic approach. And yet, um, once again, it's, it's not culturally sensitive. It's not uh, culturally relevant. Um, and uh, there's no... Uh, I think there's some amount of change that occurs, but it's not transformative or transcendent. And, uh, and there's not really a robust uh, um, capacity building within this model. So we're, uh, we're a bit concerned about it. And later on at, at the end of the presentation, we'd like to kind of share with you some of the uh, efforts that we're making to redo this in a small way um, that we, we're trying to do. So um, um, I turn it over back to Dr. Kenamore because uh, uh, we've done our research to, uh, and we found evidences that um, what we're doing, the business as usual is not working. We need to do something uh, significantly different. Dr. Kenamore? Yes, uh, so Brent and I have recently, fairly recently engaged in two uh, evaluation studies that included a qualitative component. And out of those qualitative findings, uh, uh, we got a much better sense of what, what how folks uh, experience success and, and how, uh, some ideas about how to, how to measure it. Um, so these comments that I'm gonna make are from these studies. So um, as I uh, indicated, recidivism is the, is the external measure for success. And, we strongly believe that it is a negative measure and it reinforces criminal stereotypes because, because it's, uh, you, you're successful if you didn't get back to, to prison. Um, so, uh, and, and most of the programs are designed to deal with job training, housing, overcome addictions, et cetera, um, or some combination. All that's important, but it doesn't take into account programmatically the relational component uh, that we're kind of focusing on and the psychological component. Um, there's an absence of attention to the need for uh, what we're calling dual role supportive relationships. If you're out of prison under supervision, you're, uh, you're being monitored. So part of a, a relate, an important relationship to have is one that keeps you on track and monitors your compliance, which is consistent with what it's like being in prison. But the other part of that relationship must be supportive and empathic. Uh, and that often gets left out of the equation. And there's an absence of knowledge about what, what returning citizens want and need. And this is where our, our findings come in. Uh, next slide. Um, so our findings included these, fall, these ideas. Um, Folks who are successful um, ex experience uh, change narratives about themselves. Um, they recognize that change is necessary for successful reentry uh, and the development of self-reflection skills. So almost, almost to a person, the folks that we've interviewed uh, who self-define as successfully uh, navigating um, reentry uh, have had some turnaround or change story that significantly um, changed their self-perception. Uh, they need to develop planning and preparation for a challenging future. Uh, the typical story about people getting out of prison is they have 50 bucks and uh, the guard says, we'll see you later, and they're on the street. Um, there are programs that 
build in uh, planning for reentry, uh, which are very important. And mentoring is a, can be a part of that. Um, they must be prepared to anticipate uh, temptation to return to old ways is problematic. You get out of prison in Chicago, you're African-American, you're from the South or West side, you end up back in the neighborhood with the same people that you interacted with that got you in, in trouble with the criminal justice system. Um, so there are significant barriers, some invisible, some very visible, things like can't find a, a job, can't get a job, can't get housing, um, are in, in and out of homelessness, are re realities for many uh, returning citizens. Uh, and so to be able to anticipate those barriers and find ways to address them is important. Um, and uh, one of the things that all the folks uh, emphasized as uh, important for their success or contributing to, to their success was persistence and hypervigilance. Um, staying straight is a term they use or staying on course. It's a daily activity that is, uh, is that hypervigilance is, is strong. Um, uh, and uh, being, being treated as well or hum, human um, uh, is also an important part of that transition. And folks who are African-American and poor and have a criminal background, have, a, have a many layers of, um, of uh, characteristics that uh, invite uh, uh, oppression and invite prejudice. Um, and having a place to talk about problems is important. Uh, folks in this uh, population often have very uh, negative attitudes about therapy or counseling or any kind of professional help, but they recognize that they need uh, a supportive relationship in which they can sort out their problems. Thank you. Next. So supportive, attentive, respectful relationships are important in any program that's uh, designed to help folks uh, with re-entry. Uh, they need to be respectfully listened to um, so you can think differently about the challenges that you're, uh, that you're facing. Um, it's important that supportive or helpful people challenge some of the negative or hopeless narratives that uh, folks uh, in reentry uh, carry with them. Um, and so helping uh, the person uh, achieve a more realistic and exploratory view of the reentry landscape rather than just being reactive is, is an important shift in, uh, in mindset. Uh, I mentioned uh, the dual role relationships as, as essential uh, and it has to have the empathic and supportive component. Um, so what we are arguing is that uh, defining success in reentry for returning citizens should be based on how those people who are experiencing this process define success. Okay, so um, you know, I'll go over my study. Um, what I did was is I basically looked at knowing that there's a lot of reported failures. I wanted to look at what does a long-term reentry success <clears throat> look like, and I interviewed a number of people from uh, St. Louis area, Eastern District of Missouri. I got a, a, a small grant to a federal grant to do conduct the study. And uh, one of the things uh, I wanted to look at was what were the psychological factors that keep people not reoffending but remain out in the uh, society and become successful. And I found some very fascinating stuff. But also, but before I go there, I want you to know, kind of know the uh, the amount of program established programs that are out there that is being uh, implemented, but is not does not have uh, um, huge success. 
Uh, for federal system, we have uh, this thing called staff trained aimed at, training aimed at reducing real arrest. They call it STAR, but um, they found it to be uh, not very impactful in reducing recidivism. Um, many of the um, you know reentry programs are really limited to uh, job training, job retention, so on and so forth, and or uh, uh, increasing community support through uh, stable housing. Uh, but it's really limited to reducing the recidivism. So we got it backwards, I believe. Um, and the Community Employment Program for Ex-Offenders did not reduce recidivism. Um, and employment-focused reentry programs were ineffective in reducing recidivism. By the way, the Mollhausen gentleman, he's a director of a, a National Institute of Justice who conducted all the studies and said, all those employment job training programs are not really helping with reducing recidivism. So there needs to be some change. And so uh, my study was on exploring the psychological factors that contribute to re-entry process uh, from a social work lens. But I, my background is in criminal justice, criminology and social work. So I borrow much of the uh, literature, uh, literatures from criminology. And these were the findings. Um, some of the uh, important factors to assess were that uh, career goals, the emotions, institutional mentality, career barriers, available support. And number two, factors that impede successful re-entry, discounting one's past, hurry up and wait. And I'm gonna explain this, this idea of hurry up and wait, stuck in growth and unrealistic goals. And the supervision services containment model managing behavior, structured communication and listening, successful re-entry determinants, employment, housing, good relationships, re-entry progress, not having gone somewhere, but the progress that individuals make, self-advocacy and self-determination. And um, there was a special concern for the, uh, uh, for the women population and also people who are mentally ill. Uh, significantly mentally ill or severely mentally ill. But I wanna go back and talk a little bit about hurry up and wait. Too often in our system, we have programs that demand that people when they come out of prison, they immediately enroll in programs, get the certificate, that certificate. And then once you're done with that, you have to sit and wait until there's an opening, which can be many months down the road. And this is extremely frustrating experience for many of the people coming out of prison because they have to sit there after having complied with all the demands, all the uh, mandates from the court system or the uh, supervision system. So the conclusion is that <clears throat> there needs to be a positive deviant, and this is a good word by the way, just because it's got word deviant does not mean it's bad. There needs to be positive deviant supervision strategies and practices that are culturally responsive, transformative and capacity building. Um, the system mandates that conflict with un and, and undermine any culturally responsive, transformative and capacity building supervision strategy should be abandoned. You shouldn't be asking people to do things and then there's no reward that comes with it. Okay, why would you put all that effort into it, hard work, and then later on only to find out that you can't get a job you can't be in a stable housing, you can't uh, be with your family. This is not very uh, uh, helpful. Number three, supervision advocacy strategies centered on building good relationships should be privileged. And so I keep, we keep emphasizing this idea of good relationships. And it's because for the most part, many of the returning citizens do not view the entire society, do not view the entire authorities do not view the uh, a criminal justice system as helpful. There is a um, sort of rebellion built into these uh, working relationships. But every, most of the people who are released into the community, most of them uh, are, are, I would say more than 90% are under cert certain types of uh, um, uh, some form of uh, um, you know, supervision, whether it's on a state level, county level or federal level. Number four, you have to practice listening, acknowledging to what really matters to the person, to people coming out. And what, we, what I have found in my study is that returning citizens generally in this population, they have a great need for spirituality. 
And something that many of uh, uh, agencies of uh, the criminal justice system do not want to address because of the separation of uh, church and state. But if you have a people who want to talk about spirituality, then you should talk about that. And, and really for self-advocacy and self-determination. Number five, honest conversations are very important. They want honest in, uh, uh, conversations. Uh, earlier, Dr. Kenneman talked about dual role relationship. What that basically refers to is because 90 plus percent of the people are coming out of prison need, are mandated into certain authoritative supervision, you need people involved in that authority to be honest, but very fair. So you need to be not only supportive, but really call it out. And many of the returning citizens want that because they know how hazardous it is to be out in uh, the community after you've been uh, gone uh, for so many years. Number six, lastly, reentry process progress that are reflective of cultural responsive, transformative, and capacity building should be considered as the measure of reentry success, not reducing recidivism. Uh, I think it's easy for the uh, uh, politicians, the policymakers, um, you know, program um, and funders to really look at just the numbers of what well, did this program reduce recidivism? Can you, you have evidences for that? But we haven't really gone into looking at how do we honor the progresses, the struggles that returning citizens are making to survive out in the community? Um, so that kind of concludes our uh, presentation, but uh, just to let you know, because of our belief in this and, and our research findings, both Dr. Ken and Mariah are, uh, are working on developing um, new training for uh, various uh, um, staff members at various criminal justice agencies. So they can be trained on how to think differently than the, the, the traditional method of reentry supervision. Thank you.